My name is Andrew Lowe. I'm an industrial designer with the Damani Group. We're a product development consultancy just outside Chicago, Illinois, in Warrenville. And a lot of the time, I get sketches and ideas from other industrial designers, and it's my job to t interpret their concepts and turn them into production, tool-ready uh, CAD data. So in my work, I need to create complex plastic housings. I need to ensure a correct draft at the parting line. I need to detail the insides of these parts. And in the next 90 minutes, we're going to take a look at modeling strategies and techniques I use to capture really complicated geometry and ensure that I have correct draft and details for injection molding or die casting or sand casting. But the content is really structured for parts that require draft, molded parts. And in this presentation, we're going to look at this fictional consumer product I came up with. I was inspired by the bright, high-beam HID headlights you see on some luxury cars, as well as the 18-volt tool systems a lot of uh, companies are coming out with. So this flashlight uses an existing 18-volt battery. Uh, it has to fit into the manufacturer's existing components. So the design is constrained by this component. We have a clearly defined parting line with correct draft angles for the required texture. We have lots of non-planar surfaces. Even though the shape looks pretty blocky, it's not. There's a lot of finesse that goes into the surfaces that create this product. At the top, we have a fading indent that has a chamfer that washes out. It fades to nothing. We have a complicated, organically shaped handle with a smooth transition to the flat trigger area. We have an overmold region along with a gutter for proper shutoff. And at the bottom, we have a blended, not filleted transition. So I need to start this presentation with a little bit of theory, and I'm going to start that with some spline work. In order to create good splines, we, know how to, we have to know how to analyze these splines. And the key to great surfaces is great curves. I use the curvature comb tool, which is a display showing the rate of change of a curve. And the way we create our splines have drastic effects on the quality of the curve. These splines are microscopically different. However, one was sketched by manipulating the spline handles. The other was created by adding a series of control points, and the spline is interpolated through those points. For any of you asking, this is the traditional spline uh, in all versions of SolidWorks. They did add a new style spline in 2014, which we'll get to in a little bit. So I like changing the defaults. The default colors for the curvature combs are yellow. They're very difficult to see on a white background, especially uh, in the presentation setting. And as well, I like increasing the density, uh, so that way I can see more clearly what's happening in that curve. I have a lot more uh, individual, maybe porcupine quills along that curvature comb. So let's take a look at the interpolated spline tool, the existing spline tool in SolidWorks. So there's different ways we can create geometry with this. And the cleanest is a two-point spline, which I manipulate by grabbing these control handles and moving them around. The second is a three-point spline, where I sketch a second point and I start manipulating the handles. I find this gets you into trouble real quick. If you can see, there's actually a dip or a spike in the curvature here versus the very clean geometry created by manipulating the two handles. If you do require a third point in your spline, you can have better control by using the control polygon. So let's jump into SolidWorks here. So here's a two-point spline, and I'll lay on top a multiple-point spline. You can see there's almost no difference in the spline. Look how close I have to zoom in to see any appreciable difference. But like that slide showed, the one sl spline has this flat divot here. So if we sketch with two-point splines, we have a lot more control and generates cleaner geometry. Likewise, as soon as I start manipulating this middle handle, I start getting these big spikes. Here the scale might be a little large, so we can manipulate that by turning off the curvature combs, turning them back on, and somehow the scale got bumped up to 300. It used to be at 50. So we can see that the more we manip manipulate this middle handle, the more cumbersome this spline can be to control. But if we do need that middle point, just hide that sketch. We can just grab the control polygon, and this is turned on by display control polygon by right-clicking the spline. And I can move these points around, but sometimes I still get 
that little divot in the curvature of the spline. So if possible, always try and sketch with two-point splines and then manipulate the handles. It's back into PowerPoint. But the new style spline in 2014 is a game changer in my opinion, especially when it comes to surface modeling. The style spline works similarly to the control polygon, but instead of having little gray points that we can't add dimensions to, I can actually constrain and control these construction lines. The new style spline is much smoother than the existing interpolated spline. It doesn't get those spikes or divots. It uses a new set of math. But because it's a little different to sketch with, it can be a bit foreign. But after a while, it makes some sense. So for those of you familiar with Rhino or Alias, the style spline is going to make a lot of sense to you. It works the same way as the curves in those programs. So I sketch these control points, but the control points I'm sketching aren't actually on the point of the spline. So my best practice when working with the new style spline is sketch the points, kind of rough out the curve, and then start grabbing these little vertices, moving them around, and getting the shape exactly how we need it. You know that even though I move these drastically, I'm not getting any bad spikes or divots in the curvature. The style spline creates a lot cleaner geometry, but there's certain situations where it doesn't work. It can't uh, quickly bend and zigzag like the traditional spline tool can, but if you're creating nice simple uh, curves that don't have a lot of sharp corners in them or transitions, I think the style spline is the way to go if you're running 2014 or 2015. Go back to PowerPoint here. So when we're sketching splines, we often need to connect them to other uh, geometry in our sketch. And there's different levels or quality that these connections can be. The first level of quality called tangency, or G1, is when the angle of the two curves at the junction is equal. We can use the curvature combs to analyze this connection. So we can see that the angle of the two combs here is equal but their values are different. So the radius of this curve is actually different than the radius of this curve. This is what the standard fillet tool gives us, and sometimes you can see a break in the highlight, and if you were running your hand across it, you might feel a little tiny point where the radius is changing. So the next level of quality is curvature continuous, or G2. So when the two curves are equal curvature to each other, the radius and the angle of the curves is equal, so the radius of this uh, spline is equal to the radius of this arc. However, if we're using curvature continuous connections, there's a trick I use to get even better results. This condition here is technically equal curvature and not curvature continuous. You can see that even though the radius is the same, there's not a really smooth connection. We get this little spike here, and there's a way we can improve that connection. Come on, SOLIDWORKS. So I'm going to delete this spline I created, and let's start again. So we're going to create a traditional two-point spline, not the new style spline. Sketch between these two points. I'll make it tangent to a construction line. And then I'll add the equal curvature relation here. And a lot of the time, SOLIDWORKS uh, makes the handles too long, so we can just drag that handle, drag it back, and then grab the curvature comb. And if I zoom in here, we can see we get that little spike. If I was to increase the curvature a little bit, I think we can see it even better, maybe increase the density. So you can hear we get that spike. And there's a way we can work around that. If I were to collect these two lines and add equal curvature, even though I don't, Note that I get this little lightning bolt here. And what this allows me to do is this new raised degree option in the property manager. If I just click standard, wow, we see that spike. But this is actually using a more advanced set of math and it creates a cleaner curve. But let's say I don't want to have curvature continuity to this construction line. Maybe I just want it tangent. Well, I can cheat the system by right clicking the spline, add curvature control, and I get this little lightning bolt I can just drag it down to the bottom of the spline, and once it's added, I get that raised degree option. I'll click that, and I now have a much smoother curvature continuous relation. So if you are using the traditional spline, 
And we may need to manipulate it to get this little spike out here. With a little work, we can, we can manipulate it. So this does create a lot better geometry. It's probably because I created the equal curvature relation first. This just works if we add the curvature widget on its own. So the better curvature continuous connections, add that little widget and you can get that uh, raised degree and create a lot cleaner curves. So if we are creating a curvature continuous relation between two entities in a sketch, the default value SolidWorks gives us when we add the relation usually aren't quite good. So it always is worth investigating the quality of your spline after relations have been added. Don't just trust SolidWorks to give you the best result. So I'll add equal curvature. You can see it shoot off, but it'll probably correct itself when I add the next one. And if I turn on my curvature combs here, we can see we actually have some, some dips. It's not particularly clean. So if I just drag that handle just a little bit, I can clean up that shape. And I have a lot cleaner connection. But if we want to have even better curvature continuous relations, let's use the new style spline. It does a lot better job out of the box creating these relations. So the way the style spline is sketched is through those control points. So this is the workflow I mentioned earlier. Uh, let's grab style spline. So I'm actually going to sketch just a rough shape through some points. And the style spline has a new option, curve degree. So the curve degree controls how many individual polygon or control vertices are in the sketch. So if we want to add equal curvature, we need at least four. Adding the equal curvature takes up the degree of freedom of two of these uh, vertices in each direction. You can see this first line is actually constrained. So I can move this around, I can move this around, but I can't move this up. I can only slide this along this path. Likewise, if I add tangent here, let's take a look at the quality of this spline. We can create a lot cleaner shapes. We may need to finesse them a little bit, but you can see we have a much smoother ramp up of the curvature in this area. And this kind of quality is actually called a G3, or curvature continuous connection. So when the two curves are G3 to each other, the radius is equal, uh, the angle is equal, and the rate of change of the radius is equal. We can see we have a nice smooth flow, and this provides the cleanest quality curve. And SolidWorks doesn't support G3 internally. However, we can move the points of the spline around to try and, and get it as close as possible. However, this isn't parametric. If design changes happen, we may need to go in, look at our splines, and, and evaluate the quality. However, I found one way we can cheat the system and get parametric G3 conditions, but only on a limited selection of entities. If I want to create a G3 connection between two straight lines in SolidWorks, I can do that with the new style spline. Only two straight lines. Between one line and another line, it won't work on any other, any other type of geometry. And that's just because of the way the math's working in the background. Um, that's not what I want. Oh, I didn't name this sketch. Here we go. So I have two straight lines. This line has three degrees of draft. Here I have a flat line. So I'll just delete this style spline. Let's start over. So when creating a G3 connection, I need to have six degrees of freedom, and I can constrain three on one side and three on the other. So the curve degree is six. If I forgot a point, it's just as easy as sliding this uh, or changing that spin box. And I'm not going to add equal curvature. What I'm going to do is kind of drag these up and select three of the lines, and I'm going to make them collinear to the intended G3 sketch entity. I'll select the other three lines in this direction, make them collinear to the other straight line, and if we evaluate the curvature here, I have perfect G3. A straight line has no curvature, so we can see that it's tapering down to nothing. Now I can control the shape of this G3 blend by moving these additional points along 
the length of those curves. So this is just a way to trick the underlying math in the background to get G3. So this is the only way I know of adding G3. Um, as far as I know, SolidWorks doesn't actually support G3. The solver can't figure it out. But if you do need to connect two straight lines with a perfect G3 blend, there is a way to do it in SolidWorks. So let's take a background look at some surfaces. And I want to preface what I'm going to say in the next section is this is what works for me. You may be doing something totally different way and it might work great for you. However, this is the strategy I use when modeling complicated shapes. So before I even start modeling, I want to sit down and figure out the best way of laying out my surfaces. I'm going to try and use large, four-sided surfaces. Sometimes more be, may be required. Uh, some people like to build bigger surfaces. I like to personally build smaller surfaces. I find I get more control, and so I try to lay it out with as many four-sided patches as required. When I have three and five and maybe even more sided surfaces, I default to the surface fill tool. So this tricky area here is completed with surface fill, and the other four sided patches are created with the boundary surface. And when I have a plan of how to lay out my surfaces, it's as simple as creating curves that define the boundaries of these surfaces and dropping in uh, surface patches over my curve layout. One of the very first surfaces I'll create in the model is a surface extrude. And I'm using surface extrude not to create geometry, but to as a reference. I have two different types of references I'm creating, whether I'm creating a mirror part or if I need to have draft. Now this part has a planar parting line, so it's a little bit simpler. So I create a surface extrude and I build draft into the feature. What this is going to do is act as a reference. Any surface that comes to the parting line here will be made tangent to this draft reference, ensuring that it has the correct draft angle at the parting line. The other way of using a reference surface is to create it without draft. This is useful when modeling one half of the part. Any surface that comes to the mirror plane needs to be made tangent to this surface extrude. What this is going to do is make sure that there's no little crease or, uh, or bump when it hits that mirror plane, so we have a very smooth connection. Now, I see some of you taking pictures, and I know my pace may be a little bit fast, but we'll, I'll be putting the PowerPoint and all the example files I run through on our company's website next week. So come grab a business card afterwards, get the website, download the presentation, run through the feature tree, you know, learn some things on your own time. The workhorse of my surface modeling is the boundary surface. I prefer boundary over loft because of the built-in analysis tools. I have curvature combs spaced along the surface that I can use to evaluate the curvature of the surface and its quality. Uh, in 2015, they added this to both loft and fill, so it took away that power of boundary surface. However, boundary surface does support uh, equal curvature in both direction one and direction two. Loft only supports or curvature continuity in direction two, not in direction one. And a best practice when working with the boundary surface always create boundary surfaces that have four sides. They don't have to have four profiles. They have to have four sides on the finished surface. A three-sided boundary surface introduces what's known as a degenerate point. So this is all the math is coming together in one corner, and this degenerate point causes problems for fillets, surface offsets, and shells. It really doesn't like shelling. I know the shell tool's gotten better, but the surface fill works a little better for those three-sided surfaces, we'll see why in a second. So there's different ways we can create boundary surfaces. We can create what I call a swept boundary surface, where I have one profile and a second profile. I can't generate a surface like this with loft. I can create an enclosed boundary surface from four different profiles. Boundary surface also has what's called the connector, and I can drag the connector back along an edge to create a shorter boundary surface. Note that the connector edits are not particularly parametric. If there's a big design change, they, they like to flip and, or, or revert back to where they were. Uh, the way I believe SolidWorks interprets these is a percentage along an edge. However, I find it's a really quick way to drag back and create a smaller surface. Usually, though, I'm going to come back and re-trim out this surface. So right now, I only have three profiles. This bottom profile is unsupported. And I like to think of it as kind of flapping in the wind. Because we haven't given it any direction, 
there can be little distortions in the curvature here, so I build it larger and then trim it back to an area of clean curvature. We also have the option in the boundary surface to trim by direction one or two. So if we look here, we note that the profile in direction two is actually much longer. And without this option on, the surface would extend all the way here. But I can have larger profiles and then build four-sided surfaces within those larger profiles by enabling the trim by direction one. The boundary surface supports tangent and curvature continuity in both directions. A lot of the time when adding the uh, curvature continuous option, uh, the gui it will pop up this error message saying the guide or profile curves that does not match. And I believe this can be discounted. I see it all the time and I always just click OK. And what's happening is I think that SolidWorks is there's, the math is entirely perfect. The curves may be slightly off, maybe .01 of a degree, and it pops up this error message. I just hit OK and the real way to evaluate the quality of the surface is these curvature combs. The other option on boundary surface is the tangent influence. What tangent influence does is gives more preference to the shape in one direction than the other. So we can actually use this to kind of pump up or inflate the surface in one direction. Here I had to increase it from zero to 100. We can actually see that this curve tapers down to nothing here, but by increasing it to 100, I, I don't have that taper in the curvature. So the surface fill is one of the most powerful features in SolidWorks. And the reason it is, is surface fill generates a four-sided surface. We can see this yellow grid and the red rectangle outlining it. It's a four-sided surface. It then trims it back to fit within an n-sided boundary. Here I have seven different edges, but maybe five actually distinct kind of profiles, if you will. And the boundary, sur or the surface fill, is built large and then it's trimmed back to fit that opening. So a lot of the time we may require curvature on our edges, but try and default to tangency. The reason is curvature actually can distort the surface. I applied curvature to these three edges, and look what it gave me. It gave me this big bulge here. By just adding tangency on, on the edges, I actually had a much cleaner result. And we can use some of the surface analysis tools to evaluate if we have a curvature continuous connection or not. So I like this graphic. I think it illustrates the difference between boundary and surface fill well. So imagine the outline of the patch as a frame, and we're stretching a rectangular tarp. The tarp can be any shape or size, but it always has a start with four sides. If we tried to get the tarp to fit within this boundary, we'd see that these lines here, they're all converging to zero, and this is that degenerate point I talked about earlier. But if we just draped the tarp over the frame and then trimmed it back to fit, we'd have a much smoother connection. This is what surface fill is doing. So if we have a nice, clean, four-sided outline, boundary surface is probably gonna give us more control than surface fill. But if we have this five-sided opening, surface fill creates that large five-sided patch and then trims it back to fit within the boundary. So if we have some ways of analyzing surfaces and the continuity between them, and I prefer using the zebra stripes. So the zebra stripes, if we have two edges coming to a sharp point, we can see they don't actually connect. If I had a C1 connection or tangent, we can actually see this break. And this is interpreted as a break in the highlights of the part. What the zebra stripes do is put the part in a dark room lit by a series of, of overhead fluorescent strip lighting and, a, and the part is mirror polished, mirror reflectivity. So we can actually see how the light plays off this part. And because the radius is not equal between the curves here, we can see that break in the highlights. So if we require a higher level of fidelity, C2, or equal curvature, gives us a smooth flow of the highlights. But it takes more work to model curvature continuous shapes. If the part's gonna have a heavy texture on it in the end, tangency is probably going to be good enough. But it's, if it's gonna be chrome plated, if it's gonna be a high polished part, we may wanna consider using curvature continuous modeling to get those clean shapes. We can also use the curvature display. We can see that the radius between these three curves is equal or not equal. But here the radius is changing along this first curve, and we have a smoother connection between them. So, I know I maybe bored you with a little bit of theory, so let's jump into SolidWorks for the remaining time and do some modeling. 
So before starting a tackling a tricky model like this, develop a modeling strategy. What features may we want to use to define the shape? So the top, the top's pretty blocky. I may get away with an extruded mass, uh, fill it some corners, and then maybe I have to do some manual surface work to build these chamfers. This indent is a lot trickier. We're going to have to use surface features. We'll create a new diving surface that cuts into the part. We can trim it back and then create a chamfer that fades out right along here. The handle, definitely going to be surface features and a patchwork of them. The base, well, the base can start similarly to the top. It's an extruded mass. We can fill it some corners. We may add a surface top face and then use some surface and the parting line draft tools to build that chamfer. So I'm going to begin with what I know. I know that the work flashlights use an existing 18 volt battery and I want to copy the sketch information to define that shape into my new part. And we can copy sketches between parts. I don't need this anymore. Oh, sorry, I did need that. Yeah, sure. Okay. So here, I'm going to copy. I have a sketch. I can't right click and copy, but if I select it, control C, jump into my other part, select the plane I'd like it to go on to, control V, I've now copied it into the part. And a best practice is I always create a sketch point or center line in my sketch to the origin. That way any dimensions we add go to this vertice in the sketch and not to the actual part's origin. When I copy sketches from one part to another, I do not get uh, any relations that are external. So here all I should need to do is just add the coincident relation and the midpoint and I fully define this sketch because none of these dimensions were external when they were copied in. So I'm starting with what I know. Next, I'm going to capture the industrial design intent. So on this product, I started with a sketch from an industrial designer. And then, well, I'm an industrial designer too, but I'm a terrible sketcher. So I ended up doing the surface modeling. We have other guys in the company do the, the pretty sketches. So I'm bringing this into SolidWorks, and I can do that with a sketch picture. So I've already brought this in, and the way we can do that is insert or tools, sketch tools, sketch picture, but we have to be in a sketch. I'm not going to do it because I had a crash a couple times when storyboarding this, but we can, the first thing I do is drop in a construction line and throw in a dimension, and that way I can double click the sketch and drag it and scale it to that construction line. There is an auto scale feature, uh, however, I find it doesn't really work well. I just manually scale and adjust the shape to that construction line. The next thing I jump to is creating a layout sketch. The layout sketch is used to capture all the critical dimensions of the part. I might have one on the right plane, the front plane, the top plane if required, and I spend a lot of time on the layout sketch. I try and build as much intelligence in the layout sketch as possible, so that way if critical dimensions of the part change, I can jump into my layout sketch and quickly change them, and the layout sketch should update accordingly. And I never directly reference anything in the layout sketch while modeling. This is to prevent it from being absorbed into the feature tree. I'll create a new sketch and then convert entities from the layout sketch into that new sketch. So you can see that I kind of have the ortho views roughly captured with the layout sketch. And one thing I always do in the layout sketch is dimension to virtual sharps. I don't try and build fillets into it, fillets we can add later. So the next thing I'll need to do is capture the parting line. So you can see I've converted these features into a new sketch. These all have the on edge relation. I've created a extruded surface with draft, and if we were to evaluate the right plane, two degrees, we'll see that I have two degrees on all of these reference surfaces. So these won't actually be in the part, 
but they'll be used to control the draft of subsequent surfaces. One thing I like to do is create a draft angle global variable. I'll be using the draft angle frequently throughout the part. And so if I set up a global variable, e make it equal to the draft angle, anytime I need that dimension, I can just type equals draft in the dimension box, and it'll make it equal to the global variable. As of SOLIDWORKS 2013, you can actually enter global variables and equations directly into the property manager, which is a nice touch. It saves some time. So I'm going to start blocking out the shape. And I'm going to start using solid features uh, because solid features get me a lot in one feature. Even though none of these faces may be in the final design, it generates new sets of edges that I can use to start building surface features off. So I realized I actually closed all my example files by accident, so we'll have to jump back into them. So I created these, these masses, just simple extrudes. I have some cuts shaping the front, shaping the back. But at this point, I'm going to have to start using a lot of surface features. So the top of this drill, or not drill, flashlight that looks kind of like a drill, has a surface top. But if I were to just create the boundary surface without any inputs, I may not have the correct draft of the parting line. So let's create this boundary from scratch again. I'm going to show my draft reference, and I'll hide the solid body. So this feature is created from an edge on the reference surface, and I've added that tangency to face. And I also have a curve here. So I couldn't just start with a simple sketch. The reason being is that I can't use a draft tool to add draft after the fact when doing this modeling. I have to build it into my features. We look at the bottom main mass feature. I have a center line made equal to the draft reference, and then my spline is made tangent to that two degrees. I can't rely on the draft tool. I need to be building draft into all of my features as I model. So when I create this surface, I need to think of my pull direction. I need to shape it accordingly. So I've, I've built my top surface, and how do I get it into the model? I use replace face for that. Replace face, I can take a surface body I've created and merge it into an existing face. If this block was larger, I might be able to use surface cut. Uh, surface cut's also useful if I don't have a face to replace, if I'm perhaps cutting away some edges. And then I like keeping a clean model. I use body delete and remove that face from the model. So moving down the tree, let's start taking a look at the chamfer on this bottom part. So there's two ways of creating chamfers. One's using the chamfer tool, which gives us unpredictable results because I'm chamfering this edge. And the other one is generating new edges that I'll use to manually build a chamfer with surface features. So I've created a boundary surface here. And what I'm doing with the boundary surface is using the split tool and cutting this solid body into two separate bodies. What that does is generate new edges on the part. I could use the split line feature, but when it comes to filleting, splitting the model is going to help us out, and we'll see why in a second. But if I were to look at this part from the front, I actually need a little bit of draft on this edge to kick it out. The reason being is if I didn't have that draft, I might not be able to pull that edge out of the tool. So how do I do that? This is a curved face. I can't create a sketch on a curved face. What I can do is create a projected curve. So here I just have a sketch on the front plane, and I have a little bit of draft kick. It's not a straight horizontal line. The projected curve works by taking that sketch and projecting it onto the face, creating a new 3D curve. So now when I create the boundary surface between these entities, I actually have that right draft. Going back into PowerPoint, we'll see why that's required. So if I didn't have one degree kick here, if this was just a horizontal line, the yellow indicates I don't have two degrees of draft. If I were to have that one degree kick, I get that correct two degrees of draft, 
We need to be aware of all the edges in our model and we can't necessarily build straight edges. Everything has to have a little bit of kick. This little sliver I'm not concerned about because I'll end up filling this edge anyways and the fillet will make this go away. Go back into SolidWorks here. So once again, body delete, cleaning up my tree. I'm gonna create another draft reference surface which is gonna define the chamfer. The chamfer, when viewed from the top, let's hide these bodies. We zoom in, this edge is not actually or concentric with this edge, it kind of kicks away. So once again, I need to create a new profile. And I've created a curve, a projected curve again, projecting a curve onto this edge, and now I can create my boundary surface. So I have that previously created edge, along with the curve, the projected curve, my tangency reference, I need to make sure that I'm uh, tangent to this face for the correct draft, and I've now built the first face of the chamfer. I'll use surface cut to cut away the chamfer, body delete to clean up my model. The next edge is a little simpler. Uh, I'm not too concerned where this edge lies, whereas here I wanted a, uh, a little bit of kick. So here I'm using parting line draft to build my chamfer. So I've selected the top plane as the pull direction. I've selected the edge to be chamfered. And then it kicks that back. So using surface, to generating new edges, building surfaces between them, or generating new edges and using the parting line draft tool can be a way to create much more controlled chamfers on our model. So to recap, I need to create projected curves sometimes, be aware of that draft ref kick. I'm building the chamfer between the new sets of edges I've generated. And I'm using parting line draft tool to finish the other face. So now we need to fill at the corners. And I have three different fillets here. The first fillet is when I split the two bodies in half. Because I have two separate bodies, the fillet hasn't actually propagated to this second body. If I had combined the bodies, the fillet propagates and kind of pollutes this line. It's not a clean transition between here. And if I were to fill at both faces, I actually get this result. So how can we finish the chamfer, or sorry, the fillet? So here I'm using face fillets. The reason I'm using face fillets is I have the curvature continuous option. I want that C2 connection between faces. The downside of using the face fillet tool is that I only get one fillet at a time. So here I added the rough fillet, and now I need to finish the fillet. So even though I had a bunch of uh, features show up, I always try and name the majority of my features, and if I'm not naming them, I'll dump them into a folder that describes generally what happens. That way, if uh, someone else is working on the model, they, they can interpret what I was doing and have a better idea of what feature generates what. So the split line tool can also be used to generate new edges. So here, I'm splitting faces on the model, and I'm outlining a perimeter for my fillet. I had to extend the face here, and then on the top plane, I created a new style spline, because they're smoother, and I made the style spline curvature continuous to this edge and this edge. I've used that to split out the face, delete face, and a surface trim to create a boundary. So fillets can be built manually, we just need to split out the edges, use surface trims and delete face to build that bound or patch outline, and then here I'm finishing it with a boundary surface. So here I've set up curvature to face, curvature to face, these two edges don't have any relations on them. And if we zoom in, we look at the purple curvature combs. They may be a little hard to see on the screen, but they taper down to nothing. We have a really clean, smooth blend. And if we were to evaluate with the zebra stripes, you can see how the light flows cleanly, especially this one. You can see how there's no sharp jump. It's a nice, clean blend between the two faces. So I can use surface knit, knit it back into the model and continue adding chamfers. But now I need to put the two halves back together, and this is easily done with the combine tool. 
combine adds two bodies. But sometimes combine doesn't work. There can be microscopic little differences in uh, the two faces, and parasolid, the kernel, doesn't like that. So what I do is delete one face, delete the other face, these two bottom faces that are touching each other, and then I can knit the two halves of the model together with surface knit. So to recap, we can use the features where possible to get us as much as possible. So I'm using the face fillet to get as much of the fillet as possible. But it doesn't give a good result on the top. So I'm splitting out the fillet boundary with split lines, surface trims, delete faces, building a new fillet with the surface or with the boundary surface tool, and I put the two halves back together. And so by using some surface features, I've built a lot cleaner uh, looking part. I didn't rely on the tool SolidWorks gave me. I built the required faces one by one. Now it takes a little bit longer, but you can get a lot better results out of the software. I'm going to continue detailing the top of the flashlight in the same way as the base. So I'm starting out with some rough surfaces. This guy in transparent green is a boundary surface. And you can see here why having edges on my model can help me. I created this so solid block. I used these edges to generate a new boundary surface to add the curved face here and here. I used a standard chamfer to break this edge. And this face, I just extruded a surface along its length and I used replace face again to curve the side of this uh, shape. So even though it looks pretty blocky, it's not p that, it's, it's not so. I had to use surface features and build these one by one. Here I'm adding some fillets on the rear half Let's hide these body, or we're done with them. So here is a situation where multi-body modeling can come into really good advantage to us. So I created this top shape in orange, and I didn't merge it with the bottom. The reason being is when it's a separate shape, I have more power to come in and individually sculpt this shape with surface features. So here I was able to cut it, and because it, I didn't have to worry about ending the cut here, because it's a, I need to detail the back edge of this. And once again, I create a boundary surface in the same way. I'll cut it away, use a parting line draft to add this uh, angled face, use split lines, boundary surfaces to build this corner, and finally combine to blend these two pieces together. So working with multi-bodies uh, allow you to isolate individual sections of your design and add the required features to them individually and then put them together. So we're detailing the top. So now let's take a look at the indent and the fading chamfer. So these um, kind of shapes, they can look difficult to model, but they're actually really, really, really easy. So I'm preparing the indent area. Because I modeled everything with uh, virtual sharps, I need to round off these corners, and I'm using the face fillet tool with the cord width option. What this does is create a fillet that's equal in size despite the geometry it may be implied to. So these two look the same size, even though this face is at a different angle between these two. So cord width is useful if we want to have a fillet that looks the same size along its length. So. So let's look at the indent. You can see here I put it into a folder. So I created a midplane, a symmetric surface. This is a nice little tool. Just pick two faces and it generates a plane symmetric between the two. I'm starting to shape with a boundary surface. We all know by now that there's a tangent ref or draft reference surface that this is made tangent to. There are those fillets. This is just a surface extrude, making this patch because it's straight. I needed to trim it back a little bit to create a uh, area for my fillet, otherwise it might look a little pinched here. I kind of wanted this curve to match this curve. This is just a boundary surface, the same way as I've generated the previous fillets, knit together. And here's where it starts to get a little tricky. I need to create a diving surface. So on that mid-plane, 
I created a new curve. And you can see that the curve actually cuts into the part. So let's, the resultant surface, we can kind of see it dives down into the part. And this is going to give us an area for the chamfer. I need to complete the transition. And I'm using surface fill here to do this. The reason being is that because surface build builds that patch larger, that four-sided patch, and trims it back, I don't have to worry about this shape. If I created a boundary surface here, I might act this shape would influence the boundary, and I might have some weird kind of lines going through it. Surface fill is a little better here. I use a knit, knit it in the model. And now I trim away the area of the chamfer. So I have a sketch here. I didn't use an offset because of these are angled. And even here, I didn't use an offset. I just like adding the parallel and adding a dimension on top. I find it works a little better. I also wanted to have uh, equal curvature blends here. And a good way of adding or dimensioning them is create a standard sketch fillet. That way I can call out a dimension and then I make it for construction, and then add the spline over the top and equal curvature to both handles. So what we can see here is that I have a perimeter that my chamfer is going to live between. And I have new sets of edges on my part. And I just start dropping boundary surfaces in over the top. So this part of the chamfer was, was really easy. It's the next part that, even though it looks hard, isn't. Because we created this diving surface, and this diving surface is tangent here and tangent here. When we create this new surface, it's automatically going to become tangent at this line. So I don't have any tangent constraints. There's no tangent or equal curvature on any of these flags, on any of these profiles. But if we turn off our lines, we can see that chamfer just becomes nothing, just fades out. So because we have this nice diving surface built, that's how we're controlling how these chamfers fade out. So I built this portion with another boundary surface. And finally, I'm completing this area with a surface fill. So surface fill, like I said, I, I try tangent first and then default to curvature if required. The reason I'm using surface fill here, even though this is four-sided, if we look at this corner here, we can see that this profile and this profile come to a knife edge. And uh, the, the boundary surface really doesn't like this. So the surface fill helps us out by build, overbuilding and then trimming back. Finally, I knit into the model. And I'm not going to combine the surface shape into the main body yet. I'm going to continue detailing, and then we can knit it in at the very end. But with a couple simple features, those fading kind of chamfers, they're not difficult to make. Oh, I ended the PowerPoint here, so let's start again. Sorry, bear with me here. I think Chef to 5 would have actually started from where I was at. So we're starting the indent with boundary surfaces, surface extrudes as required. I'm creating that new diving surface. And this is what can control the chamfer fading out or washing out. I'm going to trim that back, create the area for my chamfer. I'm building the chamfer with our boundary surface, just dropping them in over the existing edges. And finally, completing the chamfer with the surface fill. So now we need to move on to the handle. And the handle is a smooth, organically shaped and we're going to build it entirely with surface features. And because we did our homework earlier and figured out where we wanted our surfaces to be and what the patch layout was, it's going to help us when it comes to start constructing our curves. So I'm going to start by creating projected curves from 2D sketches. So we saw how we can project a 2D sketch on a 3D face. But we can also project a 2D sketch on a second 2D sketch to create a 3D projected curve. So here's our handle shape. So I've created a projected curve here. So note, if we investigate this sketch, 
So this sketch here is just kind of roughly in the middle of the handle if we were to show our side layout and kind of kind of see it's in the middle. So I'm projecting this 2D sketch on this 2D sketch, which is converted from the front plane layout. And best practice, there's a long standing bug in SOLIDWORKS where if I use the projected curve feature in another feature and it gets absorbed, I can't pick it from the graphics window and I can't use it in any other uh, piece of geometry. So my workaround for that, I just convert it into a 3D sketch. So I convert into the 3D sketch and actually the 3D sketch can get absorbed into my feature. I then hide them. I don't want to accidentally pick them and add relations to them. So I'm going to continue setting up some planes to outline the boundary of my four-sided surfaces. And I use the style spline here. Let's try and, oh. Just. And note, here's my two-degree draft kick. I always need to be cognizant of where my two-degree draft is. So the style spline can actually be fully defined, even though it's blue now. See, I can add these dimensions here. But just like the traditional style spline, I'm not really concerned about dimensioning these because I know these dimensions are never going to go on to a drawing. It's just an arbitrary way of defining this uh, complicated curve. So here's my boundary surface. Once I have my curves laid out, it's not that difficult. I'm creating 3D curves and dropping in boundary surfaces over top of them to guide the shape. Here I actually have a second, uh, pro or three profiles, one for the uh, draft reference, and a second for the middle 3D sketch. So I'm continuing, this is the flat trigger. So I created this with a surface extrude with a little draft. And after I'm building surface features like this, I'm always grabbing the draft tool two degrees, making sure we have that correct draft at the parting line. We see here, yep, two degrees right there. I don't see any yellow. I know I built the right draft into the surface feature. So here I'm shaping the actual flat area of the trigger. Once again, I'm creating more four-sided boundary surfaces from sketch profiles I've located on planes. Here's an example of a boundary surface where I trim this, dragged it back. So this is the actual stock size of this boundary surface, but if I were to grab this little connector, I can drag it back, but you can get that flapping in the wind here. So the next feature I do, trim it back. I know that the top of this boundary surface has, a, has clean curvature. So I'm gonna use surface knit, knit these together, and I like to complete this area of the, the handle with a surface fill. But a best practice for working with surface fill, let's uh, show the draft reference, is to create an offset of zero. So I'm copying two of the surfaces from the draft reference, hide the original draft reference body, and I'm knitting them into the model. So this gives me a closed boundary for the surface fill. But surface fill likes inputs. It likes to have direction from surrounding surfaces, and we can do that by creating guide surfaces for the surface fill. So this guide surface is just two lines in a 3D sketch with an arbitrary dimension, unmarked for drawing, and then I've made them tangent to this line and to this line, created a new boundary surface, so that way I can allow the shape of this surface to influence the shape of the boundaries or the surface fill that will complete the transition. So here's my surface fill. Note, I'm only using tangency here. I'm starting my surface fill out with tangent Let's turn off the sketches for a second. Turn on our zebra stripes. So here we actually may want to add the equal curvature relation to this edge. 
I'm evaluating the surface and see that, yeah, it's, it's actually only tangent here. Here, this edge is curvature continuous, and the top edge is pretty good too. So I can go back into my surface fill. And perhaps add curvature just to this one edge. So by adding curvature, we actually increase the complexity of the mesh grid. So the math is more complicated. It would take longer to rebuild. But if we evaluate, we now have that equal curvature here. I think I edited something incorrectly because on my previous example, this was a little smoother. So let's reload. Let's see where I was at before. I think it's when I dragged that connector. I had a detrimental change. So I know I only had tangent on that surface fill before, and it was very clean. Let's turn off our sketches and investigate. Yeah. So, so zebra stripes can actually be read two different ways. We'd increase their, their quality and we can have horizontal zebra stripes, and we can also have vertical zebra stripes. So depending on your shape, you may just want to have vertical zebra stripes. So here, if we see the vertical zebra stripes, we're very, very smooth through here. So don't just default to the one orientation. You may need to change the zebra stripes to properly see how light is reflecting off that surface. And I can also just investigate in SOLIDWORKS and just use the shaded view. I personally don't like the way real view looks. If we turn real view on, I kind of have a bunch of reflections that really aren't helping me here. But if I had it off, I can, I can, it's not as shiny. It's a little easier to see how the light's moving around that surface. So continuing on, we're creating a curved network. We're using projected curves to project two curve or 2D sketches on top of each other. And then we're dropping surfaces on top of our curve layout. Creating that flat for the trigger. I'm continuing to build four-sided surfaces. I'm creating guides for the surface fill where required to help shape it. I'm creating a closed perimeter by using the surface offset to copy the draft reference surfaces, knit them into the model. And then finally, finish it up with a surface fill. I'm using tangent on all edges and then jumping back with the zebra stripes tool to evaluate just how good that surface fill is. So I'll continue by blending the handle into the top shape. So once again, more four sided surfaces. I have another, this big boundary surface I built between these two edges on purpose. I didn't drag it back with the connectors. This is another option, even though I may have wanted the surface to end here, actually I do, I'm not going to use the connectors just because I know on rebuild they may not produce the best results. So I'm going to build that surface large, trim it back, knit it into the model, and I'm finishing this shape with a big surface fill. This is four-sided, but, and sometimes I use a boundary and sometimes I'd use a surface fill. There's really not a right way or a wrong way to do it. You know, try one technique. If it gives you a good looking surface, go with it. If it doesn't give you a good looking surface, maybe try the surface fill. Maybe it's a Monday, maybe it's a Tuesday. It all depends on, on how I was kind of feeling that day and the, what I thought was the best strategy to finish this patch. So I've built most of the handle now and I'd like to transition it into the bottom. And I could have just added a constant radius fillet, which didn't give me the best result here, because the design actually isn't a fillet. It does have a different shape. It is a blend. I could add a curvature continuous cord width fillet, which gives me a pretty good result. But the surface blend creates the highest quality result, and it can create shapes that the fillet tool can't. So don't necessarily let the, the tools in the software dictate what the design ends up looking like. Really capture what the design is, and sometimes we have to use surfaces for that.
So here I have my shape. I have my, my trigger ending here. Created a split line to define this shape. Delete face, and now I have an area for the blend. On the right plane, I have two style splines that outline what this looks like. So these two shapes are not actually different. The fillet tool would not be able to capture these shapes, hence why we're using the surface features. Now I need draft on both of these surfaces, but if I added draft in the property manager here, they'd both go the same way, either this way or this way. I need them going in opposite directions. So I use the draft tool. Parting line draft works on surfaces. It doesn't necessarily work just on solids. So I'm starting this with one big boundary surface, and it's pretty good. However, I don't know if it's actually there, but it's almost like I see a little dip here. Like it's not entirely smooth, and I can, I can see that. This may be good enough, but I can also just trim it back. I just want the middle of this boundary surface, so that way I can use two surface fills to really capture this shape and then I can knit them into the model. So don't necessarily default just to the fillet tool. We can build better transitions manually with the surface features. So creating the draft reference surfaces, trimming out the area, building a boundary surface in that area, evaluating what it looks like. Maybe it's good enough. Maybe we need a little more fidelity. Trim back, try a surface fill over the top. So we have this fillet here and I wanted to create a constant width fillet. And it has problems tapering to, to nothing, so this fillet actually washes out to zero. Because similar to the way that chamfer washed out. So let's take a look at how I built this feature. So I started by trimming out a portion of the corner. The reason I do that is by trimming it out, I can control exactly where this fillet ends. This is a good example of a constant width fillet. If I didn't have constant width on, see how much smaller the fillet is on this front edge versus the side? So cord width or constant width makes the fillet the same size along its length. So I need to blend this fillet into this large fillet on the back. I need to trim back the boundary like I did before. But I could just use surface fill at this point, and it'd probably give me a pretty good result. Pick the edges. Tangent, apply to all edges. Oh. This last one, I needed to flip the face. See, it's pretty good. It's actually here, it's, it's not good at all. So, surface fill didn't really work here. We might have been trying to do too much with surface fill. So surface fill is a powerful tool, but sometimes we gotta help it out. And I'm gonna help it out by explicitly guiding the way I want this fillet to flow out. So I've created a new boundary surface between the, the very small fillet and the large fillet. Added tangency to face. And if we zoom in here, we actually see really bad curvature. We can see the, the combs spiking here. So I just trimmed it away. And we can actually visually see that. You can almost see a, a ridge here. So I know most of that surface was good. So I'll just trim away that ridge, knit. And now let's try surface fill. Ignore this purple line. Um, it's a bug. Sometimes if you're working with uh, the, the boundary surface, it'll leave an artifact. And there's no way of getting rid of it until you close the window and start over again. But at this point, I now use the surface fill. If I turn on, and it'll even, uh, let's just reload to take a, a better look at what this finished transition looks like. <laughs> it didn't even work, so I probably might have to close this whole window. Even though a reload, that feature hasn't even been built, it's still there. Let's see if we can't. roll to the end of the tree. And we can see how cleanly this one fillet becomes larger and blends in 
and then we complete it with surface fill. So these kind of transitions can be tricky, but just think of how do we want to guide the light? What do our fillets look like? So we're kind of guiding the light by building new boundary surfaces, and then we're finishing them up with the surface fill, and then knitting them into the model. The last thing I'd like to show you today is a technique for building overmolds on parts. So overmold is a region on the flat or the flashlight that will have a soft TPE elastomer mold in a second molding operation. The main uh, ABS PC housing will be molded first, it'll be put into a second tool, and then resin will be shot over the top. However, I need to build a pocket for the resin to live in, and I also need to build a gutter, a little groove in the part, and this gutter is to help the overmold tool shut off against the main uh, part, and TPE is very viscous, it likes to shoot out and cause flash, so building this gutter can help uh, mi limit the amount of flash on the part. So the first thing I need to do is create tool bodies. When working with the overmold, I'm going to create second sets of bodies and then use these to cut away material from the main part. So if I do copy bodies in place, I get this warning message saying a translation or rotation is speci or isn't specified. I want to copy them in place. I don't want to move them anywhere. And when working with multiple bodies, it can help to use the display pane. Click this little arrow, and then all I have to do is click these bodies to show and hide them at any time. And we may have uh, upwards of six or seven, eight bodies when completing the overmolds. So let's take a look at the overmold. Roll up the tree. So here I've created a copy of the bodies. If we look at our display pane, expand the solid bodies. I have the delete face, which is the original, and then I have my copied body. So I'm gonna turn off the copy body at this point, or the original body. I wanna work on the copied body. And here I've created a cut. Let's show my bodies. So I have a layout sketch at the top of the tree defining what this looks like. So I've cut away the overmold region from the main body. And now I'm going to define the overmold thickness with the shell. So I'm removing this extra material from the model, and what I'm creating is a tool body. I'm going to create a positive shape of the overmold, and then I'm going to subtract it from the main body, creating a recess. Now add draft to the edges, but I need to remember I'm not drafting this part. I'm actually drafting the pocket in the, the substrate, so I need to be aware of picking the right pull direction. I've to add draft at the edges. Because I dimensioned the virtual sharps, I need to add fillets to round these corners off. I'm now needing to create the gutter body. So what I've done is created a copy of the shelled bodies. I've now used move face to move the faces back. I've moved the inside faces back, 30 thousandths, creating a second body that's half the thickness of the first. I've next cut away the gutter area. So I've cut the thicker body back by 30 thousandths. So I now have a step in my tool body. If I had merged these bodies at one point, it would be almost impossible to create this complicated cut. I'd have to create a whole bunch of surface offsets. I'd have to create a whole bunch of surface trims. Then I have to create a surface cut. But if I don't merge the solid bodies, I can just use the cut features to build this step. I'm going to create a copy of the overmold body now. So this is what's actually going to fit in the recess. And I'll use combine, the add tool, to complete the tool body. So I now have this step built in, and it really only took a few features. It took a shell to get the first thickness, it took a move face to build half of the thickness, and it took a cut in in from the front plane, or sort of the right plane, and it took a combine. 
So instead of offsetting all of these individual faces and creating a surface trim, we can just think wisely with our solid features and working in multi-bodies to build this recess. So I did the same thing for the other shape. So I now have, I'm also creating the overmold on the top, but in the exact same way as here. And finally, I generate my tool body or overmold pockets. SolidWorks is thinking for a second here. Oh, that's the tool body on the top. So my final part is created by using a combine and subtract. So I created my tool bodies that have that gutter built in, and then I'm subtracting them from the main body. And if we zoom in here, we've now created a recess for the overmold to live in, as well as that gutter that we can use to shut off. And it didn't take us a lot of features to build a, this complicated uh, groove. It's moving in multiple directions. And if we show, so the overmold bodies are only required for the toolmaker purposes. I need to create that pocket for the first part. Then I need to know what the external geometry looks like so that way the overmold tool can be built. So I'm defining the overmold region by cutting away what the overmold should be from the copied body. I'm defining the overmold depth with a shell and then using the draft feature. I'm creating the gutter tool bodies by using move face. I'm cutting away a little bit of material with a standard cut extrude to create this step and then I'm combining the two halves together. Finally, my main body minus my overmold bodies equals the part with the overmold recess and gutter. And here's the finished flashlight. So by breaking down complicated models like this, uh, we can use a hybrid surface solid modeling approach, use solid features wherever we can, throw in some surface features over the top to build the tricky stuff like this front here, to build this complicated organic handle, to build this fading uh, chamfer. But we can also use solid features to build complicated geometry, like this gutter, like the recess for the overmold. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you very much for coming out. I'd be happy to answer any and all questions. Once again, the presentation is available on our website. Come grab a business card. Uh, you'll be able to download that entire flashlight model, take a look at it. And if you did enjoy the presentation today, I'd love for you to uh, use the new SolidWorks 2015 app on your phone. Uh, be sure to give me a speaker rating. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much for your time.